today on Investor Talk, you were discussing economic World War III. How about we start there? So economic World War III started, I believe, in 2010 when the Chinese government decided they wanted to cut off the flow of rare earths to Japan. And we didn't notice it until uh, after the fact that it would have far-reaching uh, repercussions. And so if you fast forward to about 2017, I was having lunch with the general in uh, New York City who had just come back from the Middle East. And, and he had said to me, never in the history of the world has a number two economic power not gone to war with the number one economic power. And I left that lunch thinking it was all about missiles and tanks and boots on the ground. But the reality is, is this World War III is, is an economic world war where uh, certain countries want to control the flow of minerals that other countries require to run their economies. For example, uh, aerospace, spacecraft, and uh, SpaceX. Um, think about your telecommunications and your handsets. Think about the ability to build infrastructure on the ring of fire, um, but you can't go higher than 10 stories because you don't have the necessary critical metals to reinforce steel. So it's my personal belief, and not to put the scare into the market, that World War III has already started, but it's just an economic war and not really a, a military war as per se. One of my favorite things you said in an earlier presentation was that everybody's talking about the EV market driving the critical mineral demand. But you said that's not actually the catalyst. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Sure. So everybody's familiar with the EV market or the battery market and such. But the reality is, is without copper, electrons don't flow from point A to point B. Or, for example, cobalt. If you don't have cobalt, you're never going to have a nuclear renaissance. And if we think about Chemico's purchase of Westinghouse and the 440 nuclear power plants that are scheduled to be built, you're not going to build any of those power plants unless you have cobalt as a, as a reinforcement. So if you think about Rolls-Royce, if you think about Raytheon, if you think about, you know, the U.S. is now talking about putting uh, a spacecraft onto the moon again here in the next few days, you need cobalt as a high temperature alloy in order to be able to uh, achieve those type of goals. So we're not interested in cobalt because it's uh, in uh, rechargeable batteries. We're interested in cobalt because without cobalt, your economy can't grow. You can't expand. Uh, you won't be able to expand your businesses. And you won't be able to get to the green energy, which is really your nuclear uh, renaissance. So which of these critical minerals, you're, you're an expert in this sector, would you be prioritizing in your portfolio this week? Well, copper is one of our favorites. And obviously, it's a favorite because, again, you go back to the movement of electrons from point A to point B. Um, cobalt is very topical, but it's not topical because of the EV. It's topical because it's what's going on in terms of the Raytheons and the Lockheeds and the Rolls Royces and the Airbuses of the world and certainly of, of what's going on at NASA. Um, I like tantalum, uh, big fan of tungsten and uh, antimony, too. So those are the ones that are, uh, people are, are vaguely familiar with. My two favorite are beryllium and cesium, which are two of the, the harder uh, minerals to uh, acquire. Scandium comes a close third place into that. But in terms of accessibility, copper and cobalt are, are number one and number two on my list. And so in an economic world war, uh, do you have any recommendations on how we should proceed with regards to the, the critical minerals? I do. And it has to do with opening up um, your jurisdictional uh, viewpoint. So uh, God works in funny ways where some of the highest grade deposits are in countries that are maybe uh, more unique and complex. So we talk about North America becoming uh, uh, self-sufficient in terms of, of strategic metals. But the reality is, is most of those metals aren't being mined here right now. And for Canada, the US, even from some of the European countries to really grow, they need to have feedstock from, from these, some of these complex jurisdictions, for example, Rwanda, or Uganda, or the Congo. Um, and I think there's a relationship to be built there. Although the Chinese are there and are making their mark, I think that on the ground and in my underground experiences, they actually want to be westernized, right? They want the West to come in and embrace them and 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 help them grow economically. So I think if North America really wanted to um, secure their supply of critical metals, they need to start looking just outside the, uh, the borders of Canada and the U.S. Thank you, Russell, so much for your uh, wonderful insight into the critical mineral global market in general. And thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you.